All right. Ready to hear some good news about the market? <laughs> good news would be good, huh? Well, OK. So. <laughs> you know, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's been an interesting, it's been an interesting like three, four, yeah. Um, so we're going to start this out with where we've been, all right? Now, I've had a lot of meetings with clients over the year. And it's, it's interesting because for most of you, this is not the first downturn in a market that you've experienced, right? Uh, matter of fact, we've all lived long enough to go through multiple downturns and recoveries. So we know ultimately what's going to happen with the market. But there's one thing that, that has been constant in almost every one of my meetings. And that is that the market this time seems to be a little bit more troubling for everybody. And I started thinking about that when we were putting this presentation together. And I thought, you know what? Why are we having, why is everybody's mood just a little bit down? And then I started thinking about all the different events that have occurred over the last, just the last year. And it, it bring it conjures up a lot of different emotions, you know, some good, some bad, uh, some big issues out there. But what I would like to do is kind of go over last year a little bit, and I'm going to hit some key points that happened or occurred over 2022, so you can kind of see what I'm I'm talking about here. Uh, so we're going to start with well. COVID's still around, right? It didn't disappear. Well, it's kind of getting there, but in 2022, it was still sporadically out there, always in the news, right? Never really went away. Beginning of the year, February. Now, this is kind of a bummer. So Russia invades Ukraine. We were hoping it was going to be something short, but it's still lingering on. Then we got this thing here, right? Inflation. Who, who was around in, in the 80s when fl inflation was kind of out of control? Uh, and it's a funny thing. Yeah, yeah we all were. Uh, it's an interesting thing on inflation because they, they measure it differently today than they did back in the 80s. And if you took the basket of goods that they used in the 80s and used it today, well, inflation might be a whole lot higher than their recording it as of now. And I think everybody's feeling that in, I mean, every time you go to the market, right? Then, Roe v. Wade. Some people were very joyous, some people were very upset about it, but it was very emotional, right? January 6th committee it went on all year. And some people are like, Good, they got to get to the bottom of this. Others are like, well, this is just a sham. So it was emotions going up and down. Then, for the first time in our history, we have a raid on an ex-president's estate. Doesn't matter which side you're on, this was bad news because it set precedents. Then you got the hurricanes. I have a buddy that went down to uh, Naples after the first one, and he's like, man, it was like a war zone down there. It was that bad. Republicans take the House in the midterms. Not quite the way they thought they were going to, and certainly didn't take, certainly didn't take the Senate. So we've got a kind of a divided Congress right there. So at the end of the day, when you, when you think about it, the stock market, did the stock market go down as much as it did in 2008. Now, not, not by a long shot, right? Not even half of what the overall downturn was. How about 2000 to 2001? No, just a fraction of it. Matter of fact, it was almost, you know, from a correction standpoint, it was almost a healthy correction. In other words, under 20%. But yet still, 
our, our, our moods are, are, are is just a little bit down with everything that's been going on. But there are good things that are happening out there as well. And I think sometimes we don't get to see all that. So let's take a look at consumer confidence right now. Now, when you go through everything we just talked about, is it any wonder that we're at the lowest level in 50 years? Now, this is a bad thing, but it can also be a catalyst for a very good thing. And, and we'll talk about that as we, as we move forward. Now, jobs. The jobs are up, right? I mean, that's a good thing. It, it, if you want a job, the job is out there right now. There's literally 1.72 jobs available for every one person seeking a job. Um, you know, when I worked in the restaurant industry in my first half of my life, um, I didn't like it when unemployment went under 4.5%. Why? Because it was much harder to get workers at that point. A um, lot, of, lot of companies are having a, a tough time from that standpoint right now, but it's, it's actually very good for workers. Wages, wages are up, so this is another positive thing. You know, when you look at it, the way this chart is structured, it goes all the way back to, to 71, and it's the unemployment rate year over year. The blue is the wage growth year over year over year. And the black is the unemployment rate. Well, you look at the end of the year, unemployment was at 3.7, and the average rate increase was 5.8, which is higher than average, right? The 50-year average is at 4%. So that's pretty significant getting money into households. So that's a positive out there. Um, moving forward. Uh, we go on to inflation. Now, this is one of the bummers, but it is getting under control. They are bringing... <laughs> I didn't say it was under control. I said they are getting it under control. It's starting to come down. Now, the, the interesting part there is that they're battling this whole unemployment thing. You know, in order to get inflation really under control, unfortunately, they have to get people unemployed, but that's going to be the tough part that they're going to be working on. But when you look at inflation, we basically ended up at 7.1% at the end of 2022. Um, so, but it is, it is coming down, as you can see. Move forward, let's talk about the Fed, because you can't talk about inflation without talking about what is the Fed doing to get this under control. Now, most of you know the Fed really only has two tools in their tool belt to control inflation. They cannot control what Congress is doing. They can't control, for the most part, what companies are doing. They have two tools. One of the tools are interest rates, and they've certainly been using that, right? This chart goes back to 2000, and what it shows you is how the Fed, the Federal Open Market Committee, has been making adjustments to the interest rate over time. And if we could, if we overlaid this with booms and recessions, you'd see there's a big correlation to these humps here. Because when the market heats up too much, the Fed goes into, into his role of basically raising interest rates. And we've done it really at kind of an unprecedented rate because they're trying to be like shock and awe here to get this under control. Now, as you're looking at this, in 2023, starting out, we're at 4.38% on a Fed funds rate. The Open Market Committee is looking for next year for it to get up to about 510. So we are going to have some additional increases as we move forward here. But what they're projecting is after next year that it will start coming down 
and get more in line. Now, if you recall what the goal of the, the Fed was, is to get interest rates, inflation, everything down to 2%. Um, I'm not sure if they're going to get that, because they're not talking as if they're going to hit that anytime soon. Um, but we'll see what happens with it. Long term, um, they're hoping to get it down to 2.5 here. Now, the second tool the Fed has is their Fed balance sheet, the ability to buy and sell bonds at a mass quantity, being able to shove them into the market and pull them out of the market to adjust the market at that point, to try to keep it alive or to pull it back a little bit. Now, when you look at this chart over time, you, you look at the different presidential areas or, or, or time frames, you've got Bush, and after September 11th, things were actually relatively good during his, his tenure in there. And you can see the feds didn't do a whole lot relative to the balance sheet. During Obama's tenure, we had some major problems, right? We had the, the financial crisis. And that's where QE 1, 2, and 3 came into effect. And it just really pumped up that balance sheet. It's interesting because as times got better, starting over here and kept going, the feds were able to unravel this balance sheet a little bit. And then what happened? Then we had COVID. And at that point, it was basically QE to infinity at that, at that stage. And you can see it because we had such a, such a rise in the balance sheet. And I would say between the, between the two, I'm, no, I'm not so worried about the interest rates and how the Fed's working with that. I'm a little bit more concerned with the balance sheet. If this gets unraveled properly, which is gonna be a tough thing to do. But if they can do it properly, they can ease out of the balance sheet and ultimately keep the economy moving. If they go too fast, they could totally stall and really, really play havoc on the, the bond market. So this is the biggest challenge. This is the one of the things that we're looking at and we will be constantly watching to see where they're going with this because this is probably the biggest uh, challenge the Fed has moving forward. All right, so we talked about the balance sheet. Now let's talk a little bit about the debt ceiling. Now you've heard it in the news. You know, effectively, we've got a budget we have to go, go by in the federal government. And if we spend too much money and we go over that budget and we hit the debt ceiling, what happens? Well, you either stop spending, but what happens when the government stops spending? People stop getting paychecks, right? So that's, that's kind of a problem. So whenever the debt ceiling comes around and we run into this issue, which doesn't happen all the time, but it happens frequently, the question is, what's gonna happen to the stock market if this goes on and we, we, we have all this fight in Congress and, and whatnot trying to get it settled. Well, the fact is, is it's happened over 20 times. Uh, and what we have here is a chart that shows when they started deliberating relative to the debt ceiling, when it ended, how many days did it take for them to get this under control and decide to raise the debt limit? And then what did the market do? Well, at the end of the day, the average time it took them to get things settled was about nine days. So it doesn't usually take that long, although in 2018, it took 35. Okay, a little over a month. But here's the most important thing from an investor's standpoint. The, the average movement in the market during that time period was 0.04%. So the debt ceiling, you know, that's going to resolve itself. They're going to, they're going to be a lot of backdoor deals that are made. Then they decide to raise the debt ceiling. 
Um, probably won't be anything done relative to budgeting, but they'll have the money to keep the, the government going. Everybody will get their Social Security checks. Really uh, more of a non-issue on this side. This is the bigger issue here, though. Anybody remember what it was at the last markets past and present that we had at this time last year? Well, it was about 1.3 trillion less. Um, this is the bigger problem. This is one of the main reasons why we're doing such aggressive tax mitigation in each one of the client's accounts. Because this is coming. I mean, you just can't stop this thing. And if you think about it, from 2020, we were at $27.8 trillion. Uh, and that equated to about $84,000 per citizen of the United States. So if you're a big family, you owed a lot of money. If you're a single, eh, you owed $84,000 back then. Well, in order to pay it off today, we're up to $94,000 per citizen of the United States. That's a big deal. This is something that everybody should be writing their congressmen, senators, doesn't matter which side of the track you're on, hey, this is something we need to get under control because we're going to pay as taxpayers to get this thing fixed. Um, so this is, this is one of the issues out there. Now, why did I bring this up again this time? Well, it ultimately comes down to what happened in the news today. Anybody see that uh, Biden announced the budget proposal for 2024? Well, I'm not going to go over the whole book because uh, most people haven't even been able to dig too deep into it. But there are some highlights. First of all, this is supposed to go over the next 10 years. Not likely that Biden will be in pres a president for 10 years. Uh, so it more than likely will change over time. It always does. But that's what this is projected over. Um, overall, they expect to raise an additional $4.7 trillion in tax revenues. Where's that coming from? Well, okay. Well, I hate to say this, but both of you guys are rich. So <laughs> it's coming out of this room in some capacity. Well, you know, yeah, I get that. And they say, okay, let's, let's hit the big companies too, right? What happens when a big company has a, a cost increase? What do they do? They pass it on, right. So one way or another, it's trickling down to us. Whether it's taxes increased or whether we're going to feel the brunt and pay it for the big companies. Um, so that, that is coming, and this is one of the main reasons why we're looking at tax mitigation, and we've been doing it over time. If we'd have started just a couple of years ago, I'm here to tell you, it would be very difficult to get you guys in the position you need to be. But because we started eight years ago, we have some runway to get this thing taken care of and put you in a much better position. Now, this was a good thing. $800 billion in savings from changes to the government program. Okay. I, I like it when I see a, a budget that's going to cut a little bit. But here's what came after it. $2.6 trillion in new spending. I, we can't keep spending. And that's why I say contact, contact your representatives. Let them know that this is unacceptable. And it doesn't matter what president it is. It really doesn't matter. What matters is, is the debt's getting up there and we need to get it back down. And we can't do it by overspending. Uh, so what that does is it leaves us with reducing the debt by 2.9 trillion. That's a good thing, but it's not because of spending. I mean, we'd be over 5 trillion if we didn't do the extra spending. That's, that's you know, I can get behind that. I'll pay more taxes if I know we're actually paying things down, right? So, It'll be interesting to see where this is going to go, but there'll be a lot of uh, bantering back and forth on both sides. Now, when we look at the stock market itself, uh, rocky year, right? Up and down, up and down, up and down. 
And ultimately, on December 31st, we ended up just shy of 20% down. Now, it was down further in October. That was the low so far. Um, but we ended up the year at down 19.64%. So when you're talking about the market, many people are like, OK, but when's it actually going to hit bottom and, and move forward? And what are the catalysts that get it to go forward? Well, one of the catalysts is the PE ratios of all the companies. And this chart basically takes the S&P 500, looks at each one of the company's price earnings ratio, and computes it all into one number and says, OK, this is what the S&P as a whole is from a price earnings ratio. And at the end of 2022, we ended up at 16.65. So the real question is, when you look at this line in the center, the average is 16.82. Well, I don't think we're anywhere low enough at this point for the big money to come in and say, I've got a great buying opportunity here. So kind of think of it like going to, I don't know, Costco. You go to Costco and nothing's on sale, right? You're looking at everything. Are you going to buy a lot of extra stuff or are you going to wait maybe for the good stuff to get on sale so you can buy a lot at that point and have a savings? That kind of makes sense, right? Well, the same thing happens here. So when it gets low enough, I think it'll be one of the indicators, one of the catalysts that starts moving this thing back up. It's not the only one. Now, let's look at the returns from last year. Because last year was an interesting year, and a lot more interesting, quite frankly, in my mind, than 2008. In some ways, 2008 was actually easier than the market we're in right now to navigate. But here, we've got asset class returns. And when you look at the managed futures all the way over to US REITs, you can see there's only two that ended up positive in 2022. And that's managed futures and commodities. Well, I think we all know why commodities are up there, right? I mean, goodness gracious, you think about lumber, oil, all this stuff. Well, that's why that's up. But then you get to tactically managed companies, portfolios, and it's just a downhill slide from there. So not a whole lot from, from that side of it. You get into the US market and kind of compare it to global equities and emerging markets. And it's kind of a, a mixed bag of nuts here. Value was probably the best place to be if you were in the market from the beginning. Now, the tough part is, is you never know that until you start seeing what's going on, and then you have to make adjustments. And many of you have seen adjustments to value portfolios within your family of portfolios. We actually started pulling out of growth portfolios, not 100%. But we moved out of this over to value uh, because obviously the value is working better. Let's go a step further. Where do you hide when everything is going down in the markets? Equities and bonds. Cash, really. It's the only place to go. And as much as we don't like going to cash, we did go to cash with a percentage of the portfolio last year. Um, things are different th right now, and we'll talk a little bit about that. But you can see US high yield all the way to international bonds was double digit negative. It was a, it was a tough year for, for virtually everybody out there last year. So how did we end up? And we go back to our speedometers. Now, the, the speedometers, again, are 20 of the economic and financial indicators. And again, just so, just as a refresher, you've got a dial. Each dial represents an indicator. If it's green, it's positive. Not a whole lot of green there, right? I guess there is right here uh, where it kind of explains that that's positive. Yellow's neutral, and red is what? 
negative. Then you go a step further and you've got dials. You've got a black dial and you've got some gray dials. If there's a black and a gray, that means the hand, not dial, hand, moved from the previous month, one way or the other. So what kind of changes from November to December? Well, again, it's a little bit mixed. Inflation got a little bit better, not good because it's still high. Credit demand got a little bit worse. Business outlook doesn't look as good. Consumer spending, labor market. You know, everything kind of moved a little bit, but it's a little bit of a mix there. So the question is, is are we at a point where the stock market is going to change and go the other direction? Well, when you look at these indicators, that's probably not the case yet. So let's take a look at where we are now. Now, when you look at the markets, if, if you were at the last meeting, this was the same slide I used. Uh, and unfortunately, it's the same today as it was back then. We're back into the painful normalcy of volatility. Um, and that's going to have, it's going to keep going throughout this year for a while. So um, I, I don't want to say buckle up, but it, just expect that there's going to be a lot of volatility this year. Now, when you look at this chart year to date, you're like, woohoo, we're up, right? Uh, well, we were up higher, but we came back down a little bit, and this was on the 6th, and what is today? The 9th. It's amazing what three days does in a stock market because this came back down. Uh, we had two, two one-plus days on the downside, and I think one slightly up day. Uh, so we kind of retraced from that, the, the earlier swing up. Uh, but again, do I think that the market is going to stay positive the whole year? It's not likely that, it, that it's going to stay positive the whole year. Now, will it be positive at the end? I'm kind of thinking it's going to be. So the positive news is, is we can get through these rough patches, I think we should be positive by the end of the year. Now, when you go back to the price earnings ratio, the value of the S&P 500, we kind of went up a little bit. Why? Because the market went up. The prices went up. So the ratios got bigger. Again, not an indicator that we're ready to, to have a correction um, back to the upside. Now, when you look at this chart, this is one of those things that we look at. You guys might say, uh, but I look at it and I say, okay, when's a, when, when is it likely that the P-E ratios are going to be low enough that the big money is going to come back in? And if you look at it, you go back to 96, it was at 15.9, so that's the highest out of really all of these, but it went as low as 2.4. That's pretty low. That's a great buying opportunity at that point. And what happened with this buying opportunity? Kept going, kept going, kept going. So sometimes when the market really looks bad, there's a, there's a pot of gold at the end. We just got to get through this muck to get there. Again, 16.7 is not low enough at this point. So, but, but we'll see it. We'll see it. Um, this is really, I mean, many of you have seen this slide multiple times. Why do we keep bringing it up? Well, let's look at how this slide is set up. This is the S&P 500 intra-year declines and ultimate returns at the end of the year. So the way it works is the gray bars that was the end of year number. The red dots, those were intra-year lows. And you can see there's a lot of years where it's low before it gets positive, right? Well, there's another thing that you want to think, take a look at. When you have the down year, look at the number of years that it becomes positive again. It doesn't take much to get back where we want to be. 
But certainly that first year's return after you've hit that down cycle is a pretty significant year to be fully invested in the market. Does that make sense? So the real question is, what's going to happen in 2023? Well, if I was a betting man, which I'm not a betting man, but if I was a betting man, I would say I'd want to be all in. As soon as, as, soon as we get close to that bottom, we don't have a crystal ball. We don't know exactly where it is. But I want to be fully risk on from an equity standpoint relative to my risk tolerance. So if I'm a full equity person, I want to be all in the market when this thing's going up. Now, let's look at where we are during March from a speedometer standpoint. Again, a lot of red, a lot of yellow. Um, <laughs> we've got some positives, so that's a good thing. But we also have negatives. Again, mixed bag of nuts right now. So we're, we're, we're believing that, yes, we didn't hit the bottom yet. There is a very good chance we're going to walk sideways for the next three to six, maybe even nine months. I hope it's not nine months. But we could walk sideways for that long and ultimately turn up. But within that time period, there's a high probability we will take another 10 to 15% drop. Now, I'd be concerned if I didn't have a strategy, but you all know we have a strategy. And the strategy involves not cash this time because there's actually an alternative that's making money. And that is a cross between either a laddered treasury portfolio for certain clients, that certainly makes sense, or with interest rates going up relative to money markets, money markets become an opportunity now where they weren't last year. So it's a safe place to put money, keep ourselves in a position where when we do see that dip, we're not looking for the bottom, we're looking to pick up a delta between where we are in the treasuries and when we get into the equities. If I can pick up 4 or 5% in that swing, that's a big win for the other side. So that is the game plan as we move forward. If that dip never comes, as we, as we see indicators change, we might very well shift early. You know, again, no one knows exactly where that bottom is. But we're going to stay nimble. You know, the good thing about our firm being a smaller firm, a boutique firm, is that we are able to move a lot faster than the big dogs out there. Does that make sense? I'm going to bring up Doug here to talk a little bit about market perspectives from Dana. So let's welcome Doug Klassen, everybody. Thank you and good morning. Well, great to be here. I agree with everything Dan said. Uh, I'm going to echo a lot of it. Um, one, a side note, the tax mitigation conversation. Need to do it. Great idea, Roth conversions. I only know of one other advisory firm in America that's doing this besides these folks. It's not getting done. That makes two out of the 60,000 advisory firms in America that are doing pushing tax mitigation. And when you think, well, will they take it away? Congress will do whatever it takes to get more tax revenue, right? Look at the debt, look at the debt. We've got a problem. They're gonna have to find revenue, so they're gonna, Figure out their laws. It'll be whatever is going to increase taxes across the board, not just the rich. So uh, that's a great idea. Focus on that. It needs to be done, especially in a down market. That's a great time to do it. Now, just forward revenues of different uh, indices. And you can see since 04, the 08 credit, credit crunch, COVID, all kinds of things. There's some dips, but what do they do? They go up. They go up. America's got great workers, great companies, 
free market does great things. But what do you see right now? They're kind of topping out and rolling over the revenues. Now that's because the Fed, and we talked about it, and the interest rates in their balance sheet, they're trying to battle inflation. That's not easy. So they're raising rates, draining liquidity. Watch the Fed. Let me repeat that. Watch the Fed. They're going to be a challenge. Higher rates and, and draining the liquidity on the Fed balance sheet is tough for the stock market. So if you want to know what we're going to do, watch the Fed. If they keep raising rates, it's going to be a challenge for us as investors. Now, I will say the instant you and I finally figure out, oh, they're going to pivot and lower rates, it's too late. The market's already figured that out three months ahead of time and is running. So uh, can't quite time it, but the Fed's the 800-pound gorilla in the room by far and away. There's other things, sure, wars and tax rates and debt. Yes, the Fed's the biggest indicator. So let's all pay attention to that this year and next year. <clears throat> um, this is PE ratios, a little bit different on small cap stocks. And you can see they got pretty cheap on, on the small cap market. But what have they done? PE ratios going back up, getting a little more expensive. Dan was talking about it. We'd like to buy when things are really on sale. So uh, if you go to any, any broad market in, indice, look at the PE ratios when it's cheaper. Pick the nicest neighborhood here in, in your neighborhood in the Detroit area, housing. Do we want to buy it now or do we want to buy it if it's 30% off? Yeah, okay, so let's, 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 we're smart enough to do that. We are, intellectually. Now let's deal with our emotions. Okay, so we talked about the last year or two. Now, let's go back a little further. <clears throat> 1926. I've got all the history there is. And the green, this is the S&P 500. The green is, is a good year when it's up. The, is that mer purple or maroon? Is, 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 is when it's down. Okay? And you can see the Great Depression. Holy cow, what a bad, bad decade. And you can see uh, the 70s, rough spot, the 2000, the, the tech bubble, 08, the Lehman, the credit bubble. Okay, so we've had some bad years. But that's 97 years of history. What do you notice? More green than red. In fact... 71 years out of, on this chart, it's up, that's 73% of the time. 26 years, it's down, that's 27% of the time. Now, we go to Las Vegas, somebody puts us at a table, gives us dice, and says, roll the dice, and we promise you, we've got the historical, we know these dice are positive 73% of the time, and they're negative 27% of the time. I'll tell you what Doug's going to do. I'm going to roll that dice all night long, right? Who's ever heard of that? That's a great deal. This is, there's no lying here. This is the truth. This is audited returns. So thank goodness we live in America and have a, 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 an S&P 500 with all these great companies building new products, cars, planes, phones. I mean, my goodness. Capitalism is a great thing. Um, 10.12% 10, 10 return over the last 97 years if you do nothing. I think that gives us a little perspective. You say, oh, I don't like the market. I don't want to do anything. Okay, be careful. You're, you're your own worst enemy. Now, that was year by year. Let's just go through the real red letter uh, of each since 1957 uh, of the bear markets. Bear market is 20% or more retracement in the market, right? Because guess what? If it's down 5%, I can take it. I can. 10%, I can take it. I'm a big boy. 15%, I don't like it, but I can take it. When it gets to 20% down, I'm a mess. I'm lighting candles. I'm saying prayers. I mean, you know, it's awful. I'm calling up Rocky. What do we do? I mean, it's a mess. Okay. So here they all are since 1957, every truly bad market. And the worst two, down 49% in the tech bubble, down 56% at one point in 07. Pretty bad. We all say, oh, horrible time to buy stocks. Think about that.
that statement. Freeze that statement. Horrible time to buy stocks. Okay, but go to the far right column. Look at the far right column. Number of days. How long did they all last? Year and a half on average. Okay. I can live with that. This next one may be longer, but I mean, the Depression was the worst one, right? And that, that, that hung around for a while. But when I look at this, even in the midst of 07, 08, when it was, uh, you know, the Lehman, you know, I mean, I was ready to jump out the window some days. How are we doing now? Looking back on that. This puts it in perspective. Okay, here's a different way to look at it. This goes back to 57 again. And what I did here is I took every bad event that I could possibly think of since 1957. So we've all lived through this. Let me just highlight a few. Cuban Missile Crisis, oil embargo, oil price spike, Continental Bank failure, 87 stock market crash. We get nervous when the market's down 3%, right, today? It was down 22% in two days. We forget that. Persian Gulf War, Lehman bankruptcy, World Trade Towers. Oh, yeah, COVID. Oh, yeah, Russia, Ukraine. It's all there. Okay. That's volatility. And that's not just the last year or two. This is history. Okay. That red line is a 7% constant return, which, okay, if I get 7% safely, I think I'm fine. That's okay. Trouble is we look at this and say, well, Doug, it's not 7% it's not quiet. It's crazy. Look at the chart one more time. Where does it end up on your page? Where does it end up? Higher. Higher. Every hellish thing I can think of happened, and we're higher. And that's because of America, capitalism, great workers, great management, great companies, great product. Man, they do a great job out there. They really do, for the most part. But every one of these things that dips down below that 7% return, every one of us wasn't happy. We had that pit knotted up feeling in our stomach? We did. Well, let me ask you, let me ask Rocky, let me ask Dan, if we had bought on those bad news events or that prior slide, if we had bought here on these red letter 20% retracements. Rocky, tell me, how, what would our rate of return have been? It had been way better than a seven. So every time it says, bad time to be in the stock market, I don't want anything to do with it. No, they're probably wrong. Unless somebody blows us all up, I guess then the chart doesn't apply anymore. Don't even say that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, don't even say that. It's bad joke. Yeah. So other than that, I'm optimistic. Those top numbers, bar charts over there, is year-end 2021, oh, 19, 20, and 21. So you look at how we did those three years, 31%, 18%, 29%, and your three-year annualized return is 26. Pretty good time to be investing, right? All of us would say, hey, great market. Let's, let, you know, we should be investing, right? It's, it's strong. Remember, this is year-end 21. How do we do the next year? 22, last year, down 19.6. So we look at those three years and the average, and we say, got to be in the stock market. Uh, wrong. Then let's go to the bottom numbers. Bottom bar chart. Now this is in 02, right after the tech bubble burst. And you can see 2000, down 9. 2001, down 12. 2002, down 22%. Three-year average annualized return, down 15%. What did everybody say? Hate the stock market, don't want anything to do with it. Right? If you'd invested then, 
after that tech bubble or during that tech bubble meltdown, how would you have done? Real well. Real well. Real well. We are the challenge. The world's a challenge for sure, and it'll stay a challenge. We're a bigger challenge. We need to do a number of things. Tax mitigation and have our emotions, our behavioral finance correct. I can guarantee you only one thing that I know when to buy, and that's when everything's bad and we're down 20%. Why? Why do I know it? we're supposed to do that? Because every time it's done that, you come out looking like a winner. So I can tell you when to buy. Can't always tell you when to sell. But I know for sure when to buy when things are bad. So our emotions are the key here. And there's things you have to do. Roth conversion. Getting your asset allocation. When you've gone to cash or to treasury bonds, which is the exact right move to go to treasury bonds. And then the market, and I think the market will correct it. Corrected yesterday pretty strong. I think we will get an opportunity this year. Don't know when. But when you do get an opportunistic market that gets hit, that's when you're supposed to get back in. Not when everything's great. This is our challenge. And now we have advisors that help kind of coach our emotions. And that's, that's why it's a partnership. Because left to ourselves, I think, you know, it, it's a struggle. Um, but when you look at math, when you look at history, and you take the emotions out of it, it makes it a little simpler. It makes it a little clearer. I've been doing this 45 years. Those charts don't lie. And they tell me when there is an opportunity, which I think we're going to get this year or next, I'm going to do your Roth, Roth conversion in weakness, and you want to buy stocks in weakness. It's just how much. You know, maybe you do 50 now, 50%, 50% if you can't quite time it. There's different ways to handle it. So that's my thoughts, uh, March 2023. Can't tell you for sure what's going to happen this year. I think we go sideways and get another correction. Why? Because I think the Fed historically has always overdone it. Not on purpose. They're trying to do a good job. Let's not criticize them. They usually go a little too far because it's tough. This time it's going to be tougher. Because inflation is being driven by kind of different things, supply chain and labor chain shortages that we haven't had before. So inflation is kind of up there and resistant to what the Fed's been doing. So they've got their work cut out for them. I think they probably go a little too far, have to change their position and ease eventually. Be in front of that. Don't be late behind it. Any questions? I got one. We were talking earlier a little bit about Dana's value tent mm -hmm. and how that's played, and then what happened with growth over the last several years with the FANG companies and what Dana sees moving forward. So why don't we just touch on that a little bit? Okay, sure. Going back to Dana, um, we've been around since 1980, and we buy stocks that we pay attention to price. We've got a little bit of a value. We're not deep, deep contrarian value, but we have a little value tilt, meaning... We're not going to buy the FANG stocks or Tesla where you can't calculate their P.E. ratio. They're growing, but their price is just ridiculous in our mind. What happened to Tesla at the peak? It's down 75% from its peak. That's why we didn't buy it. Great car, great company, not, you know, no arguments there. But let's be careful about buying stocks that are just too, too expensive. Stupid decision. If one town here has a home on sale, same same. House the next, you know, next city, and it's triple the price. Which, which house do you buy? Well, we've been doing that for 25 years. What's worked in the S and P the last six years? Fang stocks, Tesla, narrow, narrow group of small little stocks. That you're you're really taking a risk in buying them. Good companies, good. I mean, there's nothing wrong with Amazon and so forth, but boy, is it dangerous. So we didn't do that. So we trailed a little bit. We kept you close, but we trailed a little bit. The prior 15 years, we, we clobbered the market, clobbered it. Now, so you look at us and say, okay, you didn't get into these FANG stocks, so you trailed by a little bit. That's okay. I don't want to be down 65% on Tesla. It's not the kind of ride I want to take. I think going forward, we're kind of probably rotating back a little bit more towards value, away from growth. Interest rates are higher. That favors value stocks. 
that should favor Dana, who's very diversified and pay, pays attention to price. We don't go down the narrow, narrow, narrow little rabbit hole and chase six stocks, the FANG stock. We don't do that. Why? Good companies, but it's dangerous. When the music stops, there's not a chair. Hope that answers your question. We got out of Disney. We got out of Royal Caribbean Cruise Lines because of COVID. We got out of the airlines, got out of Boeing. A lot of these things we had to do was like, okay, good companies, you know, nothing wrong with them. Over 30 years, they'll make it. But we don't want to be around here the next year on these names. So we spend a lot of time trying to figure that out. That's our job. And um, we don't stick with six growth stocks. Dangerous. We try to take care of the danger for you, be very diversified by good quality companies whose earnings are, are growing. They have to be growing. We just don't want to overpay for them. So that's a summary of what we, how we pick stocks. Growing, but don't want to overpay for them. And then if we see bad news, yeah, we exit quick. A little wrap up. Just a reminder of some of the things that we're looking at this year from a headwind perspective, those things kind of working against us. You know, there's going to be con continued volatility in the market. Okay, we expect that the rest of this year. Interest rates are not done going up. They may slow the rate, which is, is a positive sign, but there's still going to be increasing interest rates. And in, Sorry about that. Inflation is going to remain elevated. They've done a lot to try to correct it. But we've got a stubborn labor market. And part of that, I believe, is because we're actually in the middle of a change in technology, right? When you're hearing the terms like EV, electric vehicles, these companies are switching over. And it's costing them money to do it, but they've got to do it. They've got to get ready for what's coming next. Same thing on artificial intelligence. OK, I think of artificial intelligence like, remember back when they started talking about robotics, how it was going to take everybody's job? Yeah, it took some people's job, but it created 10 programmers to write the program through the robotics. We're going to have the same situation. Companies are in the process of evolving, okay? So they need labor in a lot of cases to make this change, or they're switching out skill sets within their labor force for new skill sets, okay? Europe is going to continue to be a drag. However, we are starting to see some signs that solid companies in Europe that are actually now paying a little bit of a higher dividend rate, 1% to 2% higher than U.S. companies, that may be something we want to bring back in. Things that are working on our behalf, as I said, the economy is expanding. It's in change, but it's expanding. Unemployment remains low. I think even as they raise interest rates and try to reduce the labor needs, force companies to quit hiring, there's still going to be a strong labor market in this. The Fed signals slowing, it's tapering, and interest rate increases. I already talked about that. So that's kind of what we're seeing moving forward. Your actions you need to take keep us in the loop on important things that are going on in your life so we can make adjustments. Tell us about any of the concerns you have. We're, you know, we're in a potential recession here. We've started. How bad? We don't know. The positive signs, as Dan showed you with the dials, it's showing that there is some easing. You know, six months ago, we didn't know if we were going to have a hard fall, a soft landing. Do they keep talking about that? We're not 100% sure, but it's looking better, more likely to be a softer landing than a crash. Those are all good things. Make sure that your legal documents, financial documents are up to date. You know, it's a good time to review those. Okay, here's what we got coming up. You take care of your family, and we will take care of you guys.